casual conversational cartoon curriculum, very concise and relatively correct, as soon as possible, as uh, simple as possible. Anatomy and physiology, just in the highlights here, chapter four, third installment right here. The last time we were together, we had looked at the general features of the cell. We had looked at the general features of the cell membrane. We had talked about how you can move things across the cell membrane, throwing a lot of vocabulary words at you. Uh, now we're looking at the cytoplasm. Again, broad generalizations about the cytoplasm. So please recall we said that uh, it's commonly considered that a cell has three main components, a cell membrane, a cytoplasm, and the nucleus. Although we sometimes say the nucleus is a part of the cytoplasm. We like to say that the cytoplasm has three general structures to it. And those three general structures would be cytosol, inclusions, and organelles. Now, cytosol is the fluid, the solution inside of the cell. You could call it intracellular fluid. And uh, it is made up of a solvent, water, and all the solutes dissolved inside of it. There are also things called organelles, which are formed elements or structures uh, that are distinctive. And then there are things that are inside the cytoplasm that just aren't that distinctive. They, they're changing in size and shape. Uh, they're not really well structured. And these things are called inclusions. And inclusions generally include things such as oil droplets and glycogen crystals. Oil droplets inside adipose tissue and glycogen crystals in things such as uh, liver cells. So these things right here are not structurally organized. They are just there. These things are structurally organized. They have a distinctive pattern to them. Now, organelles tend to fall into two main groups, uh, no membranes and membranes. And then with the membranes, they fall into two main groups, single layer membranes and double layer membranes. We'll start off with the no membranes down here. Now, sometimes in learning about the cell, it's good to have a kind of a cartoon sort of vision of the thing. And the cartoon vision right here is, okay, here's the outside cell membrane, then there's a nucleus, and then here's all those other structures inside. Many people remember these names because of um, well, their general functions and nicknames that are offered to them. So the nucleus is sometimes called the control center of the cell, and the mitochondria is called the powerhouse of the cell. So we'll offer strange little um, things like that, too, to sort of help it stick in your brain. Here we go, ribosomes. Structurally, these things look like just dark dots inside a stained slime. Actually, they have subunits inside, but for most pictures, they look just like little dark dots. Uh, the reason why they look so dark is because the stain attaches to protein, and these things are made up of RNA, but they produce protein. So it's a nickname. We call these things like a protein factory. Again, they're ribosomes. So means body. Ribo refers to the fact they're made of RNA. More about that in a second. Cytoskeletons. Inside of the cell, there's a kind of a scaffolding inside of cells that gives them their distinctive shapes. So, for example, up here, if we talked about things that are box-like or thread-like or biconcave disc or the unique shapes of the neurons, it's the cytoskeleton, that internal scaffolding, that allows it to have a consistent shape. Even in the white blood cells, their changing shape is due to the changes in the cytoskeleton. All right, uh, cytoskeleton is made up of microfilaments and microtubules. These things are made of protein. The filaments are like ropes, so they're for pulling things. The microtubules are, again, are like the tubes inside of a, a tent which has an internal scaffolding to it also. Uh, centrioles. Centrioles are known as the spindle poles. So centrioles are not obvious until a cell is about to go into mitosis or during mitosis. And these centrioles will be at the ends of what's called the spindle during mitosis and meiosis also. It creates a kind of a cage that allows the chromosomes to be separated uh, properly in cell division. Uh, the centrioles may be found in something called a centrosome during interphase. And this centrosome right here is like a, a gelatinous sphere that has the centrioles inside, or at least has one before it duplicates itself. Um, up here, we got um, organelles that have a single membrane to it, and we'll start off with ER, which stands for endoplasmic reticulum. There's two types of ER. There's rough ER and smooth ER. Uh, rough ER is lined with ribosomes. 
Smooth ER is not. Rough ER tends to be associated with protein production, and smooth ER is commonly associated with lipid production. Uh, we call the ER by nickname a roadway, an extensive roadway. It's found throughout the cell, and its main function is to move materials to different regions of the cell. Again, it is a series of flattened tubes and sacs uh, that have a lumen inside, and they are made up of, these um, tubes and sacs are made up of phospholipid bilayers, just like the cell membrane's basic structure. Okay, a vesicle, the C-L-E at the end of the word means small, a small vessel. So a small vessel, a small container. So think of these things like trucks inside delivery trucks inside the body. Uh, these things can form at the end of the uh, blind ends of the uh, ER, and they're bubble-like structures. They just sort of come off the edge right there. They fill up and they pull themselves off, and then they can drift around. Now, some of these things uh, drift to the cell membrane, connect to the cell membrane, and throw things out. Those would be called secretory vesicles. Secretory as to secrete. Uh, others stay inside the cell, and if they're carrying particularly dangerous chemicals inside, they may be a lysosome. Some means body, and lyso means break. Well, they're commonly nicknamed suicide sacs because their chemistry is so dangerous inside that they can destroy all kinds of materials. An example down here would be if something was uh, pulled inside the cell by endocytosis, maybe phagocytosis, uh, lysosomes can connect to the outside of that uh, newly formed vesicle. The lysosomes could pop to the inside and their chemicals could uh, neutralize, destroy, digest that thing that was brought in. So obviously white blood cells uh, might have a whole bunch of lysosomes to be able to do things like that, engulf something and then, then do something about it. The lysosomes. Uh, peroxisomes. Perioxisomes. Peroxisomes are what we call hazmat. In the sense, hazardous materials. Uh, these things may have all kinds of ma materials inside that also have the purpose of um, deactivating something. And uh, again, there's a, a great deal of uh, peroxisomes inside liver and kidney cells in that they are trying to detoxify, uh, buffer, neutralize uh, toxic materials in your system. Uh, a Golgi apparatus. A Golgi apparatus, in our picture down here, looks like a whole bunch of vesicles ran into each other and created this stack up right here. Uh, the Golgi apparatus, sometimes called a Golgi complex, is like a warehouse where materials can be brought in and stored, uh, maybe modified, and then later on, new vesicles can pinch off the edge of this thing and then deliver them someplace else. So that's the Golgi apparatus. And those all have single membranes on them. With double membranes, there's only two examples, good examples, and that's the nucleus and the mitochondria. The nucleus has a double membrane around it. Uh, it is the control center of the cell in that it has the majority of the DNA, the, um, the blueprints for life inside of them. There's a nuclear envelope or membrane to the outside. It is a double layer to the thing. Everything inside the uh, nucleus is called nucleoplasm. Uh, and it can control, it can contain small structures called nucleoli or single nucleolus. These things are RNA subunit factories. They create the RNA subunits that can be used for creating ribosomes later on. Uh, if we're not talking about the nucleoli, we're talking about the chromatin. That is the evenly colored material found around nucleoli inside the nucleoplasm, uh, inside of the nucleus. Uh, this is where the DNA and its protective protein structures are found. Uh, quickly down here, the mitochondria, again, double layer. The nickname is the powerhouse of the cell. This is the main site of aerobic respiration, the place where the burning of glucose is completed. Uh, it started outside the mitochondria, but it's completed inside the mitochondria. This is the main source of most of the ATP uh, produced in the cell. Uh, this is the place where the glucose is finally broken down to its last components of carbon dioxide and water. Looking more carefully at the uh, nucleus right here, again, the nuclear envelope has pores inside of it. These are continuous with the endoplasmic reticulum. So think of this sort of like the capital. The pores are like the gates that connect to the ER, which is like the roads 
that lead out into the cell. Again, a nucleolus inside of this thing, if it's visible, is basically a ribosome subunit factory. The material around it is chroma 10 in a cell in interphase, a cell that's doing its normal work. And together, these two things right here will be called nucleoplasm. Now, a uh, distinctive thing is chroma 10 is made up of protein and DNA. Uh, however, the uh, DNA is unraveled. It's being read, so to speak. We say DNA is sort of like a scroll. And to read the thing, you have to unravel it. So this would be present during interphase when a cell is actually doing its work. Now, when a cell is about to divide, say by mitosis, it needs to roll up the scrolls so they don't get torn up and the process of moving them. And when they roll these things up, when you tighten them up, that structure, which is now a bit more distinct, is called a chromosome. So chromosomes do not show up inside the nucleus except right before prophase, right before mitosis, and during the process of mitosis, or meiosis if you're talking about that. Uh, as far as the DNA's uh, structure is concerned, again, we recognize that each DNA molecule is basically a long scroll. It is divided into uh, subunits. The subunits are called genes, and each gene is basically a recipe for a particular protein, such as a structural protein or enzymatic protein. Uh, with that in mind, the DNA then is basically a, a book of gene recipes, and the product of all this is going to be proteins eventually. So the way that this uh, information is transferred is inside the nucleus, uh, a copy of each gene is made and the copy is called mRNA. Now this process of copying one gene's information is called transcription. You're writing the information down again and it does happen in the nucleus because that's where the DNA is found. The uh, mRNA then moves out into the cytoplasm, sort of like the, uh, the factory floor, away from the, the head office and goes to ribosomes. In a ribosome, the mRNA can be fed between the two subunits of the ribosomes and in essence, read. And this process is called translation. And in translation, the information from the mRNA is used to put amino acids together in the proper sequence to create the protein that was supposed to be coded up here. So. Transcription, you make uh, mRNA from DNA, from DNA, and you're just copying the information in a different language. Uh, down here, translation, you're changing the chemistry completely, and you're actually creating the protein. Uh, with that in mind, just up here, reminder that uh, a cell could be uninucleate or multinucleate. And in the case of red blood cells, we can say they're anucleate, although by definition, it's not much of a cell. Uh, as far as mitosis is concerned, we've mentioned this before, but just real quickly to remind you that in mitosis, you take one original cell and you can make 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. You just keep on going until you can make trillions of cells like the original. In interphase, the cell is doing its work. There is a nuclear envelope. There may be a nucleolus, and there's chromatin, evenly colored material around it. In prophase, the first part of mitosis, the nuclear envelope will disappear, the chromatin becomes chromosomes, and you begin to create a spindle. The uh, centrioles move to opposite ends of the uh, cell. They create the spindle in between. They catch the chromosomes inside. In metaphase, the uh, chromosomes are drawn towards the middle of the cell. In anaphase, the two sides of the DNA molecules, because they have been copied before this point, the two sides are ripped away from each other. Each side was called a chromatid until they're ripped apart. Now each one is called a chromosome. More about that later too. Uh, then in telophase, the uh, chromosomes have now gone to the ends of the spindle where the centrioles were, and they're going to stop and they're going to unfold themselves. Also during this time, the cytoplasm can be pinched into the process called cytokinesis. And eventually when you pinch the two cell membranes uh, apart from each other, you have two new cells right here. The nuclear envelope reforms itself. The nucleolus may reform itself. The chromosomes relax, become chroma 10 again. And these two cells are back in business doing their normal job.